Rafah border crossing uh, there between Egypt and Gaza is now open, uh, but apparently uh, the opening of it is still quite limited, especially when it comes uh, to these dual U.S.-Palestinian citizens that are trying to get out of Gaza at the moment. So I, I want to put up this tweet from Fox's Jackie Heinrich. She says this, uh, and she's quoting Matthew Miller at the State Department. She says, uh, Matthew Miller says, we're not making any concessions to them regarding what Hamas is getting in return for allowing foreign nationals to leave Gaza. Uh, also, Trey Yinks confirming that Americans who departed Gaza today include one aid worker from Doctors Without Borders, two aid workers from Catholic Relief Society, two aid workers from Palestinian Children's Relief Fund, uh, and Trey was awaiting word on whether they were dual nationals using other passports. Uh, so let's talk about all of this right now. We want to be joined here on Live Now from Fox with our friend Matthew Shoemaker, former intelligence officer uh, and congressional candidate in North Carolina. He joins me. Matthew, good to see you again. Uh, I'd wanted to bring you on as well today because uh, this is now where the Hamas-Israel war, at least uh, this big news headline today, has now moved and centered and focused. We're not talking uh, about the hostages Hamas took on October the 7th. Uh, some, you know, more than 200 still remain in the custody of Hamas terrorists spread throughout Gaza. We're talking about possibly dual, you know, American citizens who are stuck in the Gaza Strip, who want to get out of the Gaza Strip because it's being bombarded by Israeli forces right now as they root out Hamas targets. Um, but it doesn't seem like U.S. citizens can cross at the Rafa border crossing. It seems like still for U.S. citizens that is a very difficult task at the moment. The State Department says they will not be releasing information on whether the Americans who got out already today were dual passport holders or using a non-U.S. passport. So the border crossing may be open, you know, to other foreign nationals, uh, but to U.S. citizens, not so much. What does that say? Andrew, thanks for having me on and good to see you again. The very nature that the State Department spokesman had to say that there were no concessions made to Hamas tells me that he is in he and the State Department and the Biden administration are in a bad situation to begin with, that he even needs to say that. And, and from a per, the perspective of letting uh, foreigners out, let alone Americans, Hamas has no interest whatsoever in seeing people safe or saved. Remember, these this is an organization that uses people as human shields as a way to further their political ideology. So the fact that the Biden administration is focusing on trying to get dual citizens out at this point in time, as you mentioned, they're not even worried about the hostages, the Israeli hostages that Hamas took. They're just trying to get other people out there. The priorities from this administration are absolutely astounding. OK, and just to uh, kind of go deeper into what Matthew Miller was saying there at the State Department, uh, he said this, an initial group of foreign nationals, including U.S. citizens, departed Gaza through Rafah today. We expect exits of U.S. citizens and foreign nationals to continue over the next several days. Uh, he went on to say there are around 400 Americans in Gaza with whom we are in communication who have expressed a desire to leave. They have family members as well, who have expressed a desire to leave the total numbers, around a 1,000 people we're talking about, Matthew, uh, who want to get out of Gaza, who have some connection. They're either dual citizens or actually full citizens of the United States. Matthew Miller went on to say, and you can count both American citizens and their family members. We're going to give them specific instructions over the next few days about where to go. So we're almost a month into this, Matthew, uh, and just now, we're talking about, you know, our people who are stuck in Gaza there who want to get out through the Rafa border crossing over into Egypt and possibly on elsewhere. Just now, these negotiations are happening. Why do you think it took so long for the Biden administration, other regional partners to get this border crossing open? Why has Egypt, you know, been so obstinate about getting this done and especially about, you know, Palestinian refugees in and among themselves. They're very resistant to letting any Palestinians in through that border crossing. 
Yeah, how reminiscent this actually is and how much of a mirror this is between the Americans and the people that wanted to get out as Afghanistan fell. And now the same situation is yet happening again. And as you mentioned, we're now almost a month into this. Now, there's a couple of reasons why uh, Palestinians have been having a hard time getting out, one of which, as you mentioned, is Egypt and the surrounding countries, for that matter. They don't want these refugees in their territories for a couple of different reasons. One of them is that they are concerned that if they allow Palestinians into their territories, that perhaps they might not want to go back to Gaza, for example. So they wouldn't want to necessarily keep housing them there for that reason. But overall, I think that, and there was something that I mentioned to you earlier about there is a bombshell of a report from Politico today, and this all ties in together about how the Biden administration is fumbling their activity with regards to this catastrophe, which is what this is turning into. They are inadvertently destabilizing the Israeli government by talking with top Israeli officials and telling them that the United States would support other Israeli officials to succeed Benjamin Netanyahu. It's absolutely astounding from an intelligence perspective that President Biden is actually doing Iran's work for them. So this is entire situation is is now fumbling out of control because the Biden administration honestly does not really understand or doesn't know what it's doing. Okay, but to that point, Matthew, uh, as well, um, there's been a lot of domestic opposition within Israel uh, in the wake of the October 7th attack uh, directed squarely at Netanyahu and his government um, for, you know, intelligence failures, for essentially the fact they didn't see this coming. You have that festering right now uh, amongst, you know, some Israelis who didn't like Netanyahu, you know, before October 7th. And so you have this report in Politico seemingly, uh, you know, to bolster that. Do you anticipate we're going to see when this is all said and done a collapse of the Netanyahu government? So internal uh, Israeli po- politics is is certainly one thing. And, and it, any administration would want to at least get a handle on how I- internal Israeli politics is working. That's only smart to do. The, the problem that the Biden administration is falling into is that they are now stepping into, into the situation itself and actively telling these senior Israeli officials that the, the United States might support them if they became prime minister. That then, from an intelligence perspective, from a, a, as my own experience Uh, that I've had in the intelligence world shows is that that will impact how those uh, senior officials view the situation and how they might behave afterwards. So the Biden administration is destabilizing the Benjamin Netanyahu administration. It's exactly what the Iranians would absolutely love to do. It's it's I I am absolutely astonished if this political report is is correct, that this is actually happening. All right, we're going to get to uh, the Biden administration in just a moment, too, because I want to uh, get you uh, and your thoughts, your reaction to some comments Biden made today in Minnesota at a campaign event. Before we do that, let's get back to uh, the Rafa border crossing uh, and these Gazans and foreign nationals that are trying to you know, evacuate from Gaza. And I think this is interesting. You're seeing some of them here at the Rafa border crossing going into Egypt. What's interesting to me is that, you know, the State Department, you know, Fox has confirmed there's been about five uh, of either dual U.S. citizens or full U.S. citizens who have left. Uh, But the State Department is not going in uh, to anything else for that matter. So there could be more, uh, and we just don't know it. But uh, I want to kind of pick your brain as well uh, about this idea Senator Marsha Blackburn, the Republican from Tennessee, had today about um, these individuals here. So she is calling for the Biden administration to formally declare the approximately 500 Americans in Gaza as hostages under federal law. Blackburn said Hamas is holding approximately 500 Americans hostage. The Biden administration needs to formally declare these individuals hostages and explain to the American people how they're working to secure their release without appeasing Hamas. Uh, what do you make of that proposal there? Do you think that is something that should be acted on and acted on very quickly? Uh, if you take into consideration the fact that there's uh, around a thousand Americans and dual citizens there, uh, you know, family and full, who can't get out of Gaza, should they be classified under international law as hostages in and of themselves? 
it's certainly coming to that. And the reason I say that is because the way that or the the abilities of the American government to then um, use different avenues of approach with regards to trying to get these individuals out changes slightly, both with regards to um, uh, diplomatic and economic and, and military options that are available once those avenues are available. It also gives the right um, for uh, family members, for example, to, to advocate on their behalf. But it, all of this is actually a reason that I'm running for Congress because the, the politicians in Washington simply have no idea how the real world works and they're gonna get people killed because of their stupidity. You know, my campaign slogan alone is send intelligence to DC for good reason. This ad administration is failing. You know, President Biden's time in office is nothing less than a litany of catastrophes, unfortunately. You know, first there was the Biden's in, uh, surrender of Afghanistan to the Taliban. Sure. Then it was his weakness that invited Putin to invade Ukraine that we're now paying billions of dollars for. And now we're seeing Biden fumble his way into causing the collapse of the Israeli government. Just it's it, putting aside whether or not Biden is fit to lead us in peacetime. I have absolutely zero confidence in his ability to lead us during wartime. All right, just to put a, a kind of a tie a bow on this segment here. Um, Aisha Hasti tweeting this. Marsha Blackburn told her, quote, it's good news that those five are out. What we need to know is where are the other 500 is they estimated. What is happening with them? Why are they not being released? Uh, Matthew, while we have you, though, want to uh, get your thoughts, like I said, um, Biden said this today uh, at a campaign event there in Minnesota. He was talking about binomics there today in Minnesota. Um, and, and so there was a heckler at one of these campaign events essentially calling on President Biden uh, to publicly, you know, call for and announce there should be a ceasefire. You're hearing that a lot, the word ceasefire. And this is what Biden said. He replied, I think we need a pause. A pause means to give time to get the prisoners out. He went on, I'm the guy that convinced BB to call for a ceasefire, to let the prisoners out. I'm the guy that talked to Sisi, the Egyptian leader, to convince him to open the door, meaning Rafa. Well, what's the difference between a humanitarian pause and a ceasefire? It now seems like the Biden administration, you know, per these comments tonight in Minnesota, that that's kind of what they support in order to get, you know, Gazans, American citizens, and the hostages being held there out here. So it seems like that's where we're going. Uh, calls for ceasefire coming from the Biden administration. So there seems to be zero difference, if you will, between a ceasefire and a pause. Okay. I am completely unaware of what the distinction might be. And his definition of it, uh, it just muddles the situation even more. It just is yet another example of how he really does not understand what's going on and doesn't understand. Everything in this process should be done for a particular reason with a specific goal in mind. If there is going to be a, a pause, as he says, let's just say for a few hours to try and get people out, that needs to be concrete and it needs to be specific of how we're going to do it, when it's going to happen, and how it's going to happen. Until we get that information, there is a distinction without a difference, if you will, between a ceasefire and a pause. And the one thing that I just keep coming back to is how under the Trump administration, for example, we saw so much progress for peace in the Middle East with the Abraham Accords, but that has been absolutely squandered over the course of the past couple of years because of the ineptitude of the Biden administration. It really is quite sad. Okay, so, uh, and you know, the Abraham Accords are, are so entry. We're going to be speaking about that a little bit later on this week. I have questions about, you know, whether or not, um, you know, the Abraham Accords right now are, are fragile. You know, is the rope holding them together fraying at the moment? Uh, and you got as well the, the Saudi Arabia Israeli normalization deal that's been put on pause, the talks uh, that are being brokered by the United States in the wake of the October 7th attack. But, but to Biden's remarks here, he says, I'm the guy that convinced Bibi to call for a ceasefire to let the prisoners out. What is he talking about? Because, you know, Bibi Netanyahu, the IDF, are going full steam ahead with their ground incursion there into Gaza, striking Hamas targets. Yes, they told Gazan civilians to evacuate, uh, I believe, from the north to the south uh, as they carry out these raids there. But... I'm not entirely sure what the president means there. I don't think BB is calling for a ceasefire. Well, that would require me to believe him that he actually did impact the way that Benjamin Netanyahu decided things. It's well known in foreign policy circles that Biden and Netanyahu dislike each other intensely. 
from the days when the Obama administration pushed the Iran nuclear deal. But according to the political report that I, that I mentioned earlier, it seems the Biden administration's uh, officials aren't even aware of how their actions are, are, are damaging the state of Israel. And for him to come out and say that he is the, the one that can convince the Israelis to do certain things is, is I, I honestly do not believe that at all. All right, uh, Matthew, we cover a lot of ground with you. Uh, we just want to cover uh, on Capitol Hill as well. The House Rules Committee right now, Matthew, is meeting uh, at this very moment. Uh, they are marking up what new House Speaker Mike Johnson has put forth, a standalone funding aid package for Israel only. It's about $14 billion worth. Uh, you're running for Congress. Would you support a standalone bill for Israel? And if you do, if you would, is $14 billion enough? I would support that in theory. I would love to see what exactly that 14 billion is going for. I imagine it's going to go towards things like artillery as well as iron dome munitions. That's what I'm, uh, my initial thought process is. Now, because of the way that we conducted um, our own uh, donations, if you will, to the Ukrainians, artillery now has gone up fourfold in terms of price per round. So it's actually going to get quite expensive very quickly if we start end up if we end up donating artillery rounds to, to the Israelis. So from that perspective, in theory, yes, I absolutely would support a standalone bill to the Israelis, but I would love to see what exactly it is that they, they plan on funding them with. All right, as always, Matthew Shoemaker, uh, former intelligence officer, we do appreciate your insight into all of this. Definitely be speaking soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.